Yeah. When Honda came out with the NX500 earlier this year, it priced the motorcycle at 5.9 lakh rupees ex showroom, which is kind of expensive, but still not a real shocker for those who know because, well, this motorcycle, it costs a little over 20,000 more than the CB500X, you know, the model it replaces out here. But of course, it does come with some additional features and a different aesthetic. Now, like the earlier CB500X, this NX500 is meant to be your daily commuter motorcycle that's built for the city. And of course, it's also meant to tackle long highway jaunts with ease. But since we live out here in India, and it is, this motorcycle is costly. We want to see how this motorcycle fares against some thoroughbred Indian built competition. Cue the Royal Enfield Himalayan. Now, this motorcycle, the Royal Enfield, well, it is lacking a certain amount of capacity, power, and it obviously is down on one combustion chamber as well. But most importantly, it does cost pretty much half the price than that you would pay for the Honda. Now, we're out here to find out which motorcycle suits you best and which one does what better. But before we get to that, if you haven't already, do subscribe to the Overdrive YouTube channel. And if you haven't already, also hit that bell notification icon for some great automotive content. I'm starting off with the designs and aesthetics of both these motorcycles. The NX500 has a lot in common with the older CB500X. It essentially is the same bike with a facelift and some new tech thrown in. But on the looks frontier, I'm not too sure if I like this one better because it's slightly boxy up front. Now, this one looks like a proper mile muncher as well, but the older bike had a sharper, better flowing design aesthetic. Well, that's according to me anyway. Now, the NX500 is a very road bias machine and you can tell just by the way it looks because that half fairing up front, it's meant to deflect wind away from you while you're riding out on the highway, which is great. And then again, another telltale sign are the wheels. Now, there are alloy wheels at both ends of this motorcycle. That's a 19-inch up front and a 17-inch at the rear. And of course, the major street biased telltale sign is the 180mm of ground clearance. That is great for when you're hitting the road, hitting the streets. But then again, not so much so when you are tackling off-road trails. And of course, if you do hit some of the rough stuff, you are going to damage some of the underside of that motorcycle because there is no protection at all. Now, the Himalayan on the other hand looks nothing like the bike it replaces from the Enfield stable. It's a lot more athletic looking, not as boxy as the older bike, and it appears ready to take on all sorts of terrain and elements. Now, coming to the Enfield, well, the Himalayan has minimalistic bodywork and of course, it is ready for off-road just by the looks of it. And you can tell that the more capable machine because of the way the wheels are set up, that's a big 21-inch wheel up front, spoked of course, and you have a nice chunky 17-inch spoked wheel at the rear as well. Most importantly, you have a good 230mm of ground clearance to play with, great for tackling trails off-road. So there's no denying that the RE looks more of a butch off-road ready bike, while the Honda comes across as a soft roader of sorts. But then again, looks are subjective and both these motorcycles have undeniable road presence of their own. Now, a cool feature about the NX500 has to be its 5-inch TFT screen. Now, this unit has been lifted straight off the Honda XL750 Transalp. So, you have a pretty simple but nice, vibrant uh, layout, which gives you all the information you really want. And of course, you do have the option of Bluetooth connectivity, turn-by-turn -turn navigation, and also traction controls, something the Himalayan doesn't come with. So, the Himalayan also has a very nice and unique screen because, yes, it is round, nice and vibrant, and of course, comes with the Bluetooth connectivity and all, all of that jazz. But the main USP of this particular display is you can cast your map onto the screen, which makes it very convenient when you're on the go and you have to reach your destination, which you're very unfamiliar with. So, this motorcycle doesn't get traction control, but ABS is switchable off at the rear. The Himalayan screen also reads out a distance to empty reading, which is great to have on those long distance rides, while the Honda, well, that simply reads out the running rate of fuel consumption. The RE also gets the tank crash guards as standard, and these neat and unique taillights that are integrated into the turn signals. While the crash guards, knuckle guards, tinted wind screen, the tail rack, all that you see in the Honda here are cost extra. Something that I really like about the Honda was the way the buttons clicked and snapped every time I used them. And the joystick is backlit, which looks really neat at night. The Himalayan on the other hand, well the joystick felt quite soggy and flimsy to employ in comparison. And to reiterate, 
the Honda is a CBU unit, and you can't shy away from the build quality that feels a step higher than that of the Enfield. Now, moving on to the engine. Now, the 471cc liquid cooled parallel twin of the Honda. Well, it makes a good 47 PS of max power and 43 Nm of max torque, which is great for city and highway riding. Low down the power band in the city, you'll find it very tractable. Low down the gears. Well, it picks up nice under 2000 RPM and mid-range and top-end performance all the way up to 8500 RPM. Well, that's a whole lot of fun. And you won't really find it to be lacking any sort of power. It's one of the most fun engines you can really come across at this time. But then again, now coming to the Royal Enfield Himalayan. Now, this 452cc liquid cool single cylinder, well, it is lacking a certain amount of power and it is a single cylinder at the end of the day. So it isn't as refined as something like the Honda. And of course, it makes around 40 PS of max power, 40 Nm of max torque. And torque arrives around 1000 RPM sooner than it does on the Honda. But then again, this motorcycle, lower down the power band, under 2000 RPM, it doesn't feel very lively. It feels like it's going to stall. And around 3000 RPM, that's when it feels like, okay, we've got to get going. But the fun really starts from 4,000 to 7,000 RPM. And that's where you want to be on this kind of motorcycle. Now, both these bikes have square, bordering on short stroke engines. So, mid-range performance is supposed to be where it's at with this pair. There's a lively response every time you twist the throttle on the Honda, making getting ahead of city traffic a real breeze. But with the Royal Enfield, you'll have to be in the sweet spot and be forced into additional gear changes to really feel the rush of excitement or carry out a brisk overtake. With the NX500, power feels a lot more natural and instantaneous lower down the power band, and the twin disc setup at the front really allows to stop predictably well. Moving over to the Himalayan. Now the single disc at either end of this motorcycle provides just about adequate stopping power given this bike's performance stand. And as far as the engine is concerned, now you have to remember that this is Royal Enfield's first liquid-cooled motor out here. And there is one particular issue that you will come across with this bike. And that has to do with the engine heating up quite quickly in the city, especially when you're stuck in traffic. Also, crazy hot days like today out here don't really help matters further on that front. The Himalayan is definitely a lot happier and comfortable clocking down kilometers out on the highway. So if you're mostly going to be roughing it out in the city amongst traffic, the NX500 won't have you wagging your index finger, heated in disbelief, as the Himalayan would have you. Heat management works just fine with the Honda. And it's all there to be seen that the company have had years of experience with the liquid cool parallel twins and the finesse really shines through with the NX500. Now the suspension is set up quite soft on the NX500 and you don't have a lot of ground clearance to play with, just 180mm. So it's meant for the street, it's meant for speed and to tackle the road. Now that also goes to show when you're actually out on the road and it comes to ride and handling because the motorcycle's centre of gravity is a lot lower to the ground than it does on the Royal Enfield Himalayan and it makes it a lot more agile, a lot more flickable than the Royal Enfield. The NX500 takes over from the older CB500X very well. The suspension setup is soft but very absorbent over bumps and irons out undulations very well, provided that you are taking it easy and travelling at a steady pace. But the faster you go, the more unsettling bumps can tend to get and you'll have to ease off the gas and be a little more alert while taking on the bumps at higher speed. The previous Himalayan 411 was one of the most comfortable bikes to be astride in its class. And in that regard, this latest 450 model aces it just as well. I found the seat to be very accommodating while letting you not only adjust your posture or even stand up comfortably according to the terrain you're traversing over, but also take on corners with a pace and aggression that you would never have previously foreseen. Sure, it may not be as nimble as the Honda, but it certainly doesn't fail to impress. The longer wheelbase adds a suspension setup that's more in tune to tackling the rough stuff, makes it more stable of the pair, especially over our highway conditions. And once the roads vanish, well, this bike just is leagues ahead in terms of capability and will quite literally kick up dust in the Honda's face. Once you get the hang of what the suspension is capable of managing, taking on rough terrain is just so easy. Now the Enfield, for what it's worth, well the suspension setup is not all that soft and pretty much well balanced in terms of stiffness as well because it doesn't bog too much on the heavy braking. But then again, 
thanks to the 230mm of ground clearance. Well, this motorcycle's weight is slightly more off the ground, so it doesn't make managing it all that easy. Even for a matter of fact, getting it on main stand is a lot more difficult than something like the Honda. All right, now getting aside the NX500, seat height is at around 830mm, which is pretty manageable for my 5 foot 9 frame. Both feet on the ground pretty comfortably. And coming to the Royal Enfield, well, the seat height stands at around 825mm, but of course, look at that side stand, the way the bike tilts over, getting on is a lot easier. So if you have to choose between these two, it all boils down to what you expect to accomplish as stride your motorcycle. Now, most ADV bikes nowadays are hardly ever exposed to the challenging terrain they are built to master. Rather, they are bought for their styling and level of ride comfort they provide. Now the Himalayan, it looks handsome, has a good amount of features and is the more comfortable bike to be on. And although it might be the more demanding of a motorcycle to ride between these two, well it allows you to be a lot more adventurous in your biking life. But not so much fun in the city. So it's not flawless. Now the Honda, well it feels very well put together, an absolute gem of a street and touring bike to have in your garage. It'll absolutely blitz past the Himalayan that's pinned at 140 km per hour down an open road, but as far as its range of capabilities is concerned, it's limited to the kind of terrain you traverse over. Once again, not exactly flawless. So the NX500, yes, it'll set you back by 5 lakh, 90,000 rupees, X showroom, which is steep, but then again, it is a CBU, so the build quality, really nice. The engine, fantastic, really great, lively, enjoyable out on the road. Good for the city and on the highway, especially the suspension, well, it will keep you comfortable all throughout. But not so much so when you tend to go slightly off-road and a bit adventurous. Now, coming to the Royal Enfield Himalayan, well, yes, pretty much half the price because 2 lakh 85 to 90,000 rupees, well, good value for money. But then again, this motor, the engine, it does feel like you really have to work it a bit to get the performance you really want out of it, not so much. City friendly, I'd say, because low down the power band does tend to get little, well, unnervy. And of course, on blisteringly hot days like today, well, the engine does tend to heat up quite a bit and that can be a pain. Now, like the name suggests, it's not meant for the city, more in tune with highway riding and of course, very, very capable of the road. Now, would I buy a machine like this? Well, not at this point, because there are certain issues with this motorcycle that still exist today. Now. We have witnessed a couple of issues with uh, well, connectivity for one, uh, second being some switchgear issues and of course the most prominent being the heating issue of the engine. But very capable machine, should you buy one right now? I don't think so. As far as the Honda is concerned, yes, it is a very good and capable on-road machine. But then again, I wish it did come with uh, stuff like the, the engine crash guards, which should have come standard as part of that 5.9 lakh package. Mm-hmm.